Tolstoy and others. There is little material for the stage in the novels of Tolstoy. Those novels are full, it is true, of drama, but they cannot be condensed into dramas. The method of Tolstoy is slow, deliberate, significantly unemphatic, he works by adding detail to detail, as a certain kind of painter adds touch to touch. The result is, in a sense, monotonous, and it is meant to be monotonous. Tolstoy endeavors to give us something more nearly resembling daily life than anyone has yet given us, and in daily life the moment of spiritual crisis is rarely the moment in which external action takes part. In the drama we can only properly realize the soul's action through some corresponding or consequent action which takes place visibly before us. You will find, throughout Tolstoy's work, many striking single scenes, but never, I think, a scene which can bear detachment from that network of detail which has led up to it and which is to come out of it. Often the scene which most profoundly impresses one is a scene trifling in itself, and owing its impressiveness partly to that very quality. Take, for instance, in Resurrection, Book 2, Chapter 29, the scene in the theater during the second act of the Eternal Demo Comalia, in which a foreign actress once again, and in a novel manner, showed how women died of consumption. The general's wife, Mariette, smiles at Nekludov in the box, and, outside, in the street, another woman, the other half-world, smiles at him, just in the same way. That is all, but to Nekludov it is one of the great crises of his life. He has seen something, for the first time, in what he now feels to be its true light, and he sees it as clearly as he saw the palace the sentinels, the fortress, the river, the boats and the stock exchange. And just as on this northern summer night there was no restful darkness on the earth, but only a dismal, dull light coming from an invisible source, so in Nekludov's soul there was no longer the restful darkness, ignorance. The chapter is profoundly impressive, it is one of those chapters which no one but Tolstoy has ever written. Imagine it transposed to the stage, if that were possible, and the inevitable disappearance of everything that gives it meaning. In Tolstoy the story never exists for its own sake, but for the sake of a very definite moral idea. Even in his later novels Tolstoy is not a preacher, he gives us an interpretation of life, not a theorizing about life. But, to him, the moral idea is almost everything, and, what is of more consequence, it gives a great part of its value to his realism of prisons and brothels and police courts. In all forms of art, the point of view is of more importance than the subject matter. It is as essential for the novelist to get the right focus as it is for the painter. In a page of Zola and in a page of Tolstoy you might find the same gutter described with the same minuteness, and yet in reading the one you might see only the filth while in reading the other you might feel only some fine human impulse. Tolstoy sees life steadily because he sees it under a divine light, he has a saintly patience with evil, and so becomes a casuist through sympathy, a psychologist out of that pity which is understanding. And then, it is as a direct consequence of this point of view, in the mere process of unraveling things, that his greatest skill is shown as a novelist. He does not exactly write well, he is satisfied if his words express their meaning, and no more, his words have neither beauty nor subtlety in themselves. But, if you will only give him time, for he needs time, he will creep closer and closer up to some doubtful and remote truth, not knowing itself for what it is, he will reveal the soul to itself, like God's fly. If you want to know how, daily life goes on among people who know as little about themselves as you know about your neighbors in a street or drawing room, read Jane Austen, and, on that level, you will be perfectly satisfied. But if you want to know why these people are happy or unhappy, why the thing which they do deliberately is not the thing which they either want or ought to do, read, Tolstoy, and I can hardly add that you will be satisfied. I never read Tolstoy without a certain suspense, sometimes a certain terror. An accusing spirit seems to peer between every line, I can never tell what new disease of the soul those pitying, and unswerving eyes may not have discovered. Such, then, is a novel of Tolstoy, such, 
more than almost any of his novels, is Resurrection, the masterpiece of his old age, into which he has put an art but little less consummate than that of Anna Karenina, together with the finer spirit of his later gospel. Out of this novel a play in French was put together by M. Henry Bataille, and produced at the Odeon. Now M. Bataille is one of the most powerful and original dramatists of our time. A play in English, said to be by M. M. Henry Bataille and Michael Morton, has been produced by Mr. Tree at His Majesty's Theatre, and the play is called, as the French play was called, Tolstoy's Resurrection. What Mr. Morton has done with M. Bataille I cannot say. I have read in a capable French paper that Lorne Estereur d'Avoir pu applaudir une œuvre vraiment noble, vraiment pure, in the play of M. Bataille, and I believe it. Are those quite the words one would use about the play in English? They are not quite the words I would use about the play in English. It is a melodrama with one good scene, the scene in the prison, and this is good only to a certain point. There is another scene which is amusing, the scene of the jury, but the humor is little more than clowning, and the tragic note, which should strike through it, is only there in a parody of itself. Indeed the word parody is the only word which can be used about the greater part of the play, and it seems to me a pity that the name of Tolstoy should be brought into such dangerous companionship with the vulgarities and sentimentalities of the London stage. I heard people around me confessing that they had not read the book. How terrible must have been the disillusion of those people, if they had ever expected anything of Tolstoy, and if they really believed that this demagogue prince, who stands in nice poses in the middle of drawing rooms and of prison cells, talking nonsense with a convincing disbelief, was in any sense a mouthpiece for Tolstoy's poor simple little gospel. Tolstoy according to Captain Marshall, I should be inclined to define him, but I must give Mr. Tree his full credit in the matter. When he crucifies himself, so to speak, symbolically, across the door of the jury room, remarking in his slowest manner, the bird flutters no longer, I must atone, I must atone. One is, in every sense, alone with the actor. Mr. Tree has many arts, but he has not the art of sincerity. His conception of acting is, literally, to act, on every occasion. Even in the prison scene, in which Miss Ashwell is so good, until she begins to shout and he to rant, and then the care is over, Mr. Tree cannot be his part without acting it. That prison scene is, on the whole, well done, and the first part of it, when the women shout and drink and quarrel, is acted with a satisfying sense of vulgarity which contrasts singularly with what is meant to be a suggestion of the manners of society in Street Petersburg in the scene preceding. Perhaps the most lamentable thing in the play is the first act. This act takes the place of those astounding chapters in the novel in which the seduction of Katusha is described with a truth, tact, frankness, and subtlety unparalleled in any novel I have ever read. I read them over before I went to the theatre, and when I got to the theatre I found a scene before me which was not Tolstoy's scene, a foolish, sentimental conversation in which I recognized hardly more than a sentence of Tolstoy, and this brought in in the wrong place, and, in short, the old make-believe of all the hack writers for the stage, dished up again, and put before us, with a simplicity of audacity at which one can only marvel, a thing imagination boggles at, as an adaptation from Tolstoy. Tolstoy has been hardly treated by some translators and by many critics, in his own country, if you mention his name, you are as likely as not to be met by a shrug and an ah, monsieur, il divague un peu. In his own country he has the censor always against him, some of his books he has never been able to print in full in Russian. But in the new play at His Majesty's Theatre we have, in what is boldly called, Tolstoy's Resurrection, something which is not Tolstoy at all. There is M. Bataille, who is a poet of nature and a dramatist who has created a new form of drama, let him be exonerated. Mr. Morton and Mr. Tree between them may have been the spoilers of M. Bataille, but Tolstoy, might not the great name of Tolstoy have been left well alone?